I didn't know what to do at all. I, I couldn't concentrate. Um, I, I was barely eating. I Hello. Uh,我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什么？我们在做什
Now we have this uh, wonderful program at UCA is called the WAVES. Um, this program will deal exclusively with Asian American youth mental health issues. Uh, I, I'm so happy to see uh, uh, some new and old uh, uh, partners and uh, uh, individuals who made this uh, program tonight possible. Uh, all the WAVES uh, staff people and our partners, I see uh, Juliana, uh, who was the uh, speaker at our 2018 uh, convention. And I see Polly, our old friend. Uh, you, you can't these days have a good discussion on issues about the use without Polly. And uh, I see Irene, uh, it's such a gracious lady. She has uh, helped uh, so many people who suffers from that issues. Uh, and I also see Dong Liao Mama, uh, Li Ren, uh, for her gracious, gracious help, always in the background, make sure everything will happen. Uh, and, and a wonderful, wonderful young teams that many of them I just met and seen the first time. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna have a, a very special moment tonight by Chang Fu, um, one of the, the few people that I really admire for making documentaries and the films and it was a great heart and I hope this will get right to your heart tonight. Thanks. Thanks so much, Haipei. Uh, as Haipei mentioned, uh, this film is so impactful and it has personal stories, uh, each with their own uh, experiences, heartbreak, resilience, um, and it's really a privilege to be here and to have uh, a few of the individuals actually in the film with us to speak on our panel tonight. Um, one thing to note before we start is a disclaimer that this panel is not treatment. Uh, it's not to offer professional medical advice, but simply to serve as a platform for discussion and to increase mental health awareness. So if you feel that you need um, to take a step back and process what you hear, please feel free to step away from your computer and take care of yourself. And if you have any immediate concerns regarding your health, safety, or well being, please do also direct those questions to a mental health provider or your primary care doctor. I'd also like to introduce the translation logistics. Uh, this is new for a lot of people. This is my first time using translation in a webinar as well. So if you need to, um, there is an, a button in the Zoom tool, uh, toolbar called interpretation. So if you click that interpretation button, you'll see English, Cantonese, or Mandarin. And you can select Cantonese or Mandarin, and we have two very talented interpreters waiting for you to help with the Cantonese and Mandarin. Next, I'd like to instruct you all on the Q&A box. So next to the interpretation button, you'll see Q&A. Um, you can feel free to type your questions into that box and we will have chat box monitors um, as well as Q&A monitors um, and we'll filter your questions appropriately. So whether to be answered in live or to be answered directly in that box. I think that covers the logistics. Um, so I hope that you enjoy this program. A little bit about UCA Waves. Uh, we are a branch of the United Chinese Americans, a national nonprofit. And Waves stands for Wellness, Advocacy, Voices, Education, and Support. We are completely devoted to destigmatizing mental illness and promoting mental health, specifically addressing the unique challenges of Asian American individuals and especially youth. So let's get started with tonight's webinar. Our first speaker is Mena Liu. She is a board member of the Howard County Chinese School. Um, and she is the professor of communication at George Washington University. Dr. Liu, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good evening, everyone. 
Um, as Dr. Ming Li, who's chair of the board of directors of the Howard County Chinese School is traveling and cannot join us today. So as a board member, I'm honored to take this opportunity to thank our partnership organization, UCA Waves, for organizing this wonderful webinar. With over 1,000 students, the Howard County Chinese School in Maryland has committed itself not only to the education of the Chinese language and cultural heritage, but also to the well being of our students and families, especially during a global mental health pandemic. We all know it's not easy um, to engage our community in such critical conversations because the Chinese culture has a strong stigma about mental health that makes it a taboo topic. So we are honored to co-sponsor this webinar with UCA Waves. And I just want to thank all of our panelists for being with us to share your stories and insights to promote mental health literacy and save lives. Um, we also hope that our audience can join us tomorrow evening for another event sponsored by Howard County Chinese School to watch a documentary about how high school students' college application process and participate in a community, key, community conversation about Chinese American youth's identity development, family communication, and mental health related issues. I will share detailed information in the chat box. Thank you all and back to you, Jennifer. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Liu. That's such impactful work. So this is a great introduction to the film which is also deeply touching, and I'm very hopeful that it will speak to a lot of people here tonight. In the film, for the first time, two families share their difficult journeys to help our community understand and deal with mental health issues. Um, after a 12 minute clip from this film, we have experts here who will lead discussions on factors that contribute to depression, suicides, and other forms of mental illness. This is actually the premiere of this short documentary. And even though it's not the full version, we are very, very excited to show you just this clip of a, one story.我跟我先生呢认识呢是高中啊，所以当时呢也算是早恋了。那十六、十五岁情窦初开的时候呢，就大家就认识了，所以感情非常的深厚啊。那时候是他追我了，就是他的性格非常的开朗，他小时候就是
酗酒、喝酒，喝的很多。I think、um, when we were back living in China with me and my dad, or me, my mom, and my dad,、um, there was one night where he came home drunk, and then he like smashed stuff around, and then he hurt himself. So there was like blood on the ground. 但是我们并不知道他是用这种喝酒。来摆脱他辛苦，他甚至跟我有一次在吵架的时候呢，他都在有说，他说你是一个白痴，他在骂我了，而你是个白痴，你难道不知道我的脑子生了病吗？当时是先生的哥哥给电话的，那时候他也是在中国嘛。她说现在是先生是送去急救了，当时丈夫送去急救了。当时我我说好好的怎么会送去急救，在宾馆里面。当时我第一个反应是他，因为国内的假酒很多，我怀疑他喝喝喝了假酒，所以是不是出了什么事情？隔了几个小时，现在哥哥就说他已经走了。那我当时是大脑一片空白，我，我，我，我真的不知道，我，我是不知道当时会，会，会，会，会，到底怎么？他才四十岁哦，那时候我说，你怎么都想不到，所以我也不敢跟我女儿讲，我，我怎么跟女儿讲呢？我 ，It was like a Friday afternoon. I think, and she when she dropped me off at my middle school, I could tell something was wrong because she was just trying really hard not to cry. But then that day when I came back home, you know, she she kind of went to my room, sat me down. You know, she's like, I I know you're only 13 years old, but I feel like you're you're a strong girl. You can handle it. So she told me, you know, like your dad passed away, and I think it it, it really hit me like really hard. Because I've never experienced like the death of a loved one so close to me, it it felt like like someone had just severed my arm, kind of like that feeling of loss. We didn't really have suspicions of his mental illness until I became sick.、Uh, I wasn't really sleeping. I think I was just like. 哦，那他是整晚通宵的不睡，第二晚又是通宵的不睡，而且这个不睡呢，跟一般的那种啊，因为有些什么事件呢出来。不一样，他是睡不了。But then it turned into like three days, four days, like just no sleep. And I remember locking myself in my room because my my thoughts were just going like crazy, like it was just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And to some point, it didn't even make sense anymore. And that eventually came to a stop when my mom called 911 on me. 当时，后来他被送到医院去的时候，也被关起二十四个小时都要监察的这个阶段。就是精神病并发嘛。I know that for the majority of those, you know, three four months when the illness initially started, that I was not myself, you know. 那这个是发作，就是一发不可收拾，就是吓人到什么程度呢？就是啊，他完全不不不认得我是谁，他不认得我是他妈妈，要我弹钢琴给他听。就我是不会弹钢琴的，然后他就会骂我，就说你怎么这么笨，连钢琴都不会，完全变了一个人。You know, because it wasn't me, right? Per se, it was the illness that manifests itself in that way. But having her to hear that and feel that from someone who looks just like her daughter, sounds just like her daughter, to say those things, I think it it really like breaks my heart as well to see how how this illness can not only negatively affect me but affect those around me. 先生又走了，女儿又患病了，那我们的确当时是陷入了人生的低谷。我记得那个时候，我女儿，我女儿发病的时候，家里就剩我跟她两个人嘛。那发病的时候，我是不能离开她半步，就是她会突然冲到街上去，不管那个车上面的车，街上面的车是怎么开，就是她完全已经没有理智了。
。那我想，我那时候就已经有病发 panic disorder。后来他们诊断就是恐慌症，就我一下恐慌症就发作了，然后我就是整个倒在地上，我不能动。但是女儿那时候也在发病，所以女儿只能在我身边走过，然后很冷漠的看看我。她跟我说的一句话就是：“你现在知道是什么滋味了吧？”就讲这样一句话。所以我，我我那时候就觉得这个人生没有任何意义。所以我当时就想，就说要不我们都走了吧，都不要在这个世界上了。这生命对我们来说已经没有任何眷恋的了，这样的生活我们怎么能够继续？去 help others.、Um, I'm sure she does blame herself to a certain degree for what, for what、um, you know, our family or what my dad eventually happened. But in a way, I feel like her helping all these other people is trying to like kind of to atone for herself too.、Um, because this is just one tragedy, right? This is just one story out of the potential hundreds, thousands, millions out there. And she feels that if she can share our story and open up. About all the pain that we've been through, of all the things that could have been different if actions were taken, and use that knowledge and use that example to save other families, you know, and prevent other tragedies. I think that's what brings her the most amount of fulfillment. Uh, in mental health field, in the Asian community, it's always been a debate topic. 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 呃，晦气，或者是说大家恐惧讲这件事情。那我实际上在呃十几年，就是就已经在推广，就是这个，就是大家应该发声出来，把这个事情讲出来。It, it's hard for me to talk about certain things, obviously, but I've always been very open. Not just you know us right now, but I I try to bring up mental health with my friends whenever I can. I try to tell them, you know, you're not alone. This is very common, you know. Feeling that I was helping others and I was advocating and I was sharing my story, it actually like lifted me up a little bit and and helped me too, you know. I know that for her, it it's much more frequent that she thinks about him than me. I think for her the burden is much greater than mine.、Uh, so sometimes I do talk to her, you know, kind of check in with her, and then or she'll tell me. Stories of when he was younger, when they were together, like just like stupid stuff they done, like funny stuff they done. 等到女儿真正得到医治以后，是她说：“妈妈，为什么我不早一点发病啊？那如果我早一点发病的话，爸爸可能就不会死了。” If he was around, I'm sure he would have so much wisdom and knowledge, you know, to to lend to me, to help me through all these difficult times. So it was like a combination of you know I'll I'll be like watch me I'll I'll, I'll grow up to be like amazing, but then like also like fear like no I don't want to end up like him, but then also just just like sadness you know like I miss him I miss him so much, if only he was around you know like how much would he have? So for me currently,、um, having you know this mental illness is is going to be an ongoing battle. It's going to be something that you have to learn to live with and manage for the rest of your life. You know, maybe at some point it won't be a battle; it'll just be kind of like a management kind of thing.、Um, but you know, it's like every single time I face adversity, I always gain tools that help me to cope and manage better in the future, to continue moving on. And I know that every time something really, you know, very very difficult, very sad, very hurtful happens. And I'm in that very, very bottom, like rock bottom state. You know, I know that I've walked this path before, and I have methods and ways of helping myself get back up. Well, thank you so much,、uh, Professor Chong, and everyone who is involved in the making of this film. Thank you, Elaine and Irene, for sharing your story.
Um, I'd like to provide a small summary and then an introduction to our next speaker, the filmmaker himself. Um, it was such a privilege to hear the story with the courage and the sacrifice that it involved to bring up this story again and again. And we got to see loss after loss, but also the love and perseverance that Irene and Elaine had to keep going and to see the next day together and the potential hundreds, thousands, millions out there, to quote in Irene's words, are the people that they are hoping to touch by sharing their stories and preventing anything like this from happening to others. And so thank you so much. Um, if you would like to share your story with Professor Chung uh, for the making of this film or uh, otherwise just to share, um, please do reach out. Uh, we'll have the contact information in our chat box in Zoom. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Chong. He is the creator of the film that we just previewed, and he is also a U.S.-based award-winning filmmaker. Over the past two decades, he's directed and produced a dozen acclaimed documentaries, which have been shown on PBS, National Geographic TV, BBC, major film festivals, as well as TV channels internationally. His work has been featured in leading media outlets, including the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, NBC News, and NPR. We are honored to have Professor Chong as our UCA WAVES communications director and filmmaker, creating work as impactful as the film we have just previewed. Thank you for being here, Professor Chong. Would you please tell us a bit more about the context of this film? Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for your nice introduction. And uh, thank uh, you for so many members of the audience to uh, spend this uh, Saturday evening be with us. Yeah, this is uh, uh, really a rough cut, uh, very rough. And I feel a little bit embarrassed because uh, the last minute I Literally, just like a half an hour before th this presentation, I, you know, exported this uh, timeline and music did not work. I have really beautiful music, and but as Jennifer mentioned, that I am you know, committed to do a major documentary piece, telling the stories of our community to make a change. And I really the. It, the, uh, this is a great experience for me. I have been doing this for long, but this is something very special. And I like to thank Irene, uh, uh, um, Elaine, uh, Sandy, and uh, her parents. I, I did not, you know, cover the Sandy story because there are so many, many like uh, materials. I just feel uh, to be honest with you, too hard for me to put their stories in 10 minutes. Just stay tuned. I, we are definitely going to do uh, a very good one to, to tell their, their really sad and inspiring stories. And I also, you know, one thing I really want to mention, Sandy, Sandy's parents, uh, Elaine and, uh, the iron are really my, our heroes. It takes a lot of uh, not only effort, time, but for them to go through this, to share the story in the audio to the audience. It's, it's a really amazing. I could see the pain and how, how much time they would need to recover of the shoot. Okay. Finally, I like to thank you know, the organizations I listed and particularly some of the folks here, like Lily, Jennifer, good folks at UCA Waves. And I'd like to thank my two production students I know they are there. Um, uh, the, the Allison and Reed, and they are doing a great job. I am so proud to be a professor to teach you know, film and video production for my students. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chong. Next, I'd like to introduce our speakers, Elaine and Irene. 
The story in the film is incredibly touching, and I think it may have even more of an impact when you know just how much these two individuals have gone on to advocate for their communities. Elaine Pun is the founder of Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities, otherwise known as NAMI Chinese. She's a renowned mental health advocator and educator in the US. Her outstanding contributions have been reported by local and overseas media, such as the World Journal, China Daily, US China Press, Chinese Radio, and Vice. In 2020 alone, MHACC has successfully prevented an estimated 23 suicides in the US that had roots in depression. Irene Wei, Elaine's daughter, is also a passionate advocate for the destigmatization of conversations around mental health. She represented NAMI's young patients to Congressman Eric Swalwell and expressed her concern for mental health for students in the US Capitol in 2017. Irene also took part in California's Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission by acting as a Youth Innovation Project Planning Committee member. It's an immense privilege to be able to hear your story, Elaine and Irene. Thank you for the sacrifices you've made to share what you've been through. Would you please tell us a bit about the purpose of telling your story? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, uh, I'm Yiling Pen. I'm honored to have this uh, opportunity to discuss a more difficult topic in our community. For everyone who knows me well, they know that I always work with others to promote mental health. So I agree at first, I thinking of uh, thinking that that is that was an interview. But when I realized that we are going to fill um documentary, it made the process feel a lot more challenging. I had to put it everything away and now I need to force myself to remember all the details of where um, I was still with my husband. It was very hard for me, but I was still willing to do this. I believe the meaning of this film is to let everyone know that this disease can take away human life and destroy families. But if we, but if we know more about this disease and learn to manage it, we can still be full of hope, and the life can return to normal. I began to devote myself to the firm of mental health advocacy in 2012, and since then I found a mental health association for Chinese communities. Having held many families, I am willing to walk side by side with anyone on this road to recovery. Thank you. Ms. Irene. Hi, um, hi everyone. I'm Irene. I, I echo a lot of uh, similar sentiments to my mom. So, this documentary is actually my first time sharing my family's story publicly. It was difficult for me to share such a vulnerable side of myself and my life story. At times, I had trouble trying to recall certain memories because there was so much pain attached to it. Um, there were things on my mom's side of the interview that I had completely blocked and had no recollections of doing whatsoever. Um, although opening a wound that has caused me so much em emotional turmoil in the past was challenging for me, I also found it to be an extremely meaningful step in my journey of advocating for mental health discussion. I really hope this documentary can shed some light on an issue as important as this. There are so many potential conversations about the severity of mental illness that goes instead. The sooner we can normalize reaching out and seeking help, the more tragedies we can prevent. 
I just want everyone to know that mental illness is treatable and much more widespread than we've been taught to believe. I really want to see a future where everyone can talk freely and openly about their struggles without judgment. I believe this documentary will be one of the many resources that will guide us towards this path. And I hope that this film will reach many people and let them know that they're not alone. Thank you, Elaine and Irene. I truly do believe that this film is reaching a lot of people who um, appreciate and are touched by your story. Next, I'd like to introduce our fifth speaker, Juliana Chen. Um, she is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, an instructor at Harvard Medical School, and the associate director at the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Cross-Cultural Student Emotional Wellness, which supports the emotional wellness and mental health needs of Asian and Asian American students. She also serves as co-director of the Resilience Project's Parents and Caregivers Program, an innovative community outreach program outside of Boston that works with schools and parents to support the emotional wellness of children and teens. As a SAMHSA Minority Fellow, Dr. Chen served as executive producer of the short documentary film, Looking for Luke, which has been screened across the US to reduce stigma and break the silence around mental health issues in particular within the Chinese American and larger Asian American community. She additionally facilitates parent skills groups and regularly speaks on the topics of resilient parenting and family-based interventions to address mental health issues. Juliana, thank you so much for being here and sharing your expert knowledge with us. Would you please share more about why you became a mental health professional as well as the unique mental health related challenges that you've observed in Asian American communities? Of course, and thank you, Jennifer, so much for that lovely introduction. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. I know um, it's a lot to talk about in a small amount of time, but I'll do the best that I can. I know many of you here with us may not necessarily be familiar with mental health treatment and what that means for me to be a psychiatrist. So. Just for a little bit brief background and context, I am a physician, as Jennifer mentioned. I'm a second generation Chinese American. So my parents immigrated here to the US and my siblings and I were born and raised in the greater Boston area. I went to medical school and completed residencies in adult and child and adolescent psychiatry, but spent most of my time working with kids, teenagers, college students and parents. I am primarily a clinician. So what that means is I see patients directly for therapy and medication management. And I do a lot of work in the community, working with schools and families and talking in events like this. I especially love working with the Asian community. So it means so much to have all, all of you here with us. And it means so much to have the opportunity to be here and to be speaking alongside this really incredible group of panelists. So thank you. Um, for the first question, in terms of how I came to my work, when I was a psychiatry resident in Boston, I really couldn't help but notice how infrequently I saw Asian patients. They just so rarely presented for mental health treatment. And when I did see patients, it was unfortunately almost always after someone had been struggling for usually an extended period of time, or it was in times of crisis. So um, maybe after months or years of struggling or steady decline for students, maybe it was after a long time of falling grades or high anxiety and panic symptoms or increased isolation or changes in mood. There could be ongoing substance use like alcohol as mentioned in the film. Sometimes it would be in the setting of self-harm and most alarmingly would sometimes be after a suicide attempt. So knowing the prevalence of mental health disorders as a physician and personally knowing the experience of growing up as an Asian American student, I just knew there had to be individuals out there in our community struggling, likely alone without family support or the support of professionals. So Jennifer had briefly mentioned my film, Looking for Luke. This is what initially inspired me to make that film, um, which tells unfortunately the tragic story of Luke Tang 
who was a Harvard sophomore who died by suicide on Harvard campus in 2015. And I made that film in an effort to decrease suicide risk and break the silence around mental health, especially within Asian American families. That is also one of the reasons why I so appreciate this incredible film that Chung Fu is making and also Elaine, Irene, both of you and Sandy and her parents so generally sharing their stories to help our community have important conversations like this. Um, again, I know we don't have that much time, but in terms of mental health and within the Asian American community, I first want to re reiterate what Elaine mentioned and what Irene also mentioned, just to acknowledge how powerful mental health stigma is, in particular within the Asian community. I think this is one of the biggest barriers to individuals getting help. Also, when thinking about Asian American mental health, unfortunately, it can be really hard to get accurate information as how the Asian community and really all racial and ethnic minority groups think about mental health is culturally different than how it is traditionally defined and studied. So Asians as a whole typically underreport symptoms. So what this means is this leads to generally lower rates of diagnosed psychiatric illness, but it doesn't mean that psychiatric illness does not exist. In our community, generally, we don't have the vocabulary to talk about mental health or feelings. It's just not what we are accustomed to. We typically handle difficult topics and feelings by pushing them aside and perhaps not talking about them when we should. In the Asian community, oftentimes we see what we call somatization. And this is the idea of experiencing physical symptoms in place of psychological ones. So essentially feeling our feelings in our body. So things like fatigue or headache or changes in appetite or sleep, these are more familiar and culturally appropriate ways to communicate emotional distress rather than saying, I'm struggling, I'm depressed, or I'm anxious. And many of you know in our culture, there's a high premium on saving face and not making waves. And the message many Asian and Asian American youth unfortunately get is not to worry or not to complain and to put our head down and work harder. So mental health treatment, unfortunately with this combined with mental health stigma can often lead to treatment being seen as a last resort. And this can place our youth at increased risk. Data is limited, but what we do know is that overall mental health issues in the Asian American community are on the rise. This includes serious mental illness, in young adults. This includes major depression in both teens, young adults, and older adults, so across all age groups. It's very well documented that Asian Americans have higher rates of social anxiety, and Asian American women have high rates of um, disordered eating, and they are less often diagnosed and treated. There is additionally evidence that Asian American college students have higher rates of depression, and both Asian American high school students and college students have higher rates of suicide thinking, and Asian American college students are more likely to engage in a suicide attempt. And this is one of the other stories in Chung Fu's film on the topic of suicide and depression. I should mention, this relates to my film Looking for Luke as well, that unfortunately nationally there are on average 1,100 campus suicides each year. So these are not small numbers at all and Asian Americans are three times less likely to seek mental health treatment than any other racial group in the United States. So please think about that for a moment. Just wanna emphasize how much this has to change. Just as with physical health, everyone has mental health and everyone at some time in their lives will struggle to varying degrees with mental health symptoms. So if there's one takeaway I'd love for you all to have is just that mental health and mental health issues are universal. And I know we're running out of time, but really briefly, some, some statistics for those of you who appreciate numbers. One out of five individuals, and this includes children and teenagers, will experience a mental health disorder in a given year, right? So one in five, 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses begin by the age of 14 and 75% begin by the age of 24. This is what drove me to child and adolescent psychiatry. This means things start early and early identification and treatment are key. Psychiatric illness is extremely common. It most often manifests, as I just said, in childhood or early adolescence. 
It is treatable and in many, many cases, they are preventable, but only if we talk about it. And so I'm so appreciative of this webinar and all of you being here with us today so we can have important conversations like, like this one. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. And we do have a bit of time left. Um, we'll have a Q&A discussion with each of our panelists that we've heard from very briefly thus far. Um, right now, uh, we do have a little bit of a break for all of our participants um, while we do a poll and also show some results from our pre-survey during registration for this webinar. Um, so in this time, we would love for everyone to take a biology break, use the restroom if you need to, take a little stretch. Um, and as you do, I will also go through some of these survey results. It says here that there, the responses were in the 400s, um, but we are very, very happy and privileged to say that there were over 500 people who registered for this event. As you can see, um, lots of states were represented, um, the vast majority of which were from California, as well as Maryland, Massachusetts, Illinois, and New Jersey, as well as North Carolina and New York. Um, so I think we have over 30 of the 50 states here. So thank you for signing up, everyone. And we also have the uh, age differential. Um, we do have quite a few young adults um, and people 25 to 40. Um, but we do have a, the majority of people between 41 and 56. And honestly, the messages in today's webinar are universal. And I imagine that a lot of the people in the 41 to 56 age category are parents or grandparents. Um, so we hope that you'll carry this message and the things you learn today to the rest of your family. Um, I think we also have results regarding why people signed up for the webinar, and we hope that our Q&A can address some of these purposes and goals for you all. Um, the most common reasons were to hear personal stories about mental health issues, as well as to gain knowledge and ideas to discuss with family, and to decrease shame and stigma surrounding mental health issues. A lot of folks put in their own reasons too, a lot of which was to educate themselves, understand more, um, to show support and to be together with other people, which is something we love to connect. Um, and also to find ways to become more involved, to help other people, which is something we want to help with too. Uh, we're all here together um, and we hope that we can serve each other. Next, I'd like to introduce the two polling questions. The first of which is uh, just to get a sense and to share um, which of the following types of mental health providers have you or your children used before? Um, and this poll might be helpful just to see um, what else is out there if you haven't tried some of these avenues for support and also to get a sense of um, the, the common ways that people do go to seek support. I believe this is also a checklist. So if you have more than one that you've seen before, you can put all that apply. Okay, for the sake of time, I think we can cap it. Um, we have about a, a third of the participants who have responded so far, and it looks like the, the
the number one choice was counselor or therapist, and then was psychologist, followed by psychiatrist, and then primary care physician. Really, there's no right answer to this. Um, all of these providers uh, are great, as long as you're seeking out support. Um, we also had the second question, which was, which of the following would you find most helpful and want to participate in? Um, and this is something that UCA Waves is very interested in because we want to do what will have the biggest impact and what you'll find most helpful. So it looks like more personal stories about coping with mental health issues was number one, followed by resources for emotional health and wellness, and then peer support groups and mental health first aid training. The good news is that we will have more personal stories as Professor Chong is working on the full documentary. And we do have some resources that will be shared at the end of this webinar. And if you'd like, you can always go to our UCA WAVES website where we have many, many resources listed for you. And we've tried to organize it for you to, for your convenience. Um, and not to mention, we also have trained trainers for mental health first aid, and we hope to organize more trainings that are open to the community. And we have talked about peer support groups and have started asking for interest. And hopefully in the next year or two, we'll start those up as well. So thank you all for responding to those polls. I hope you had a good stretch and biology break. And next, um, this might be the part that many people were looking forward to most. Well, we have our Q&A with our panelists. So while we're waiting for our panelists to get all ready and to start their videos, um, please feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A box. We'll continue to answer those within the box as well as in person, um, directing them to the uh, panelists directly. Um, so as the Q&A box is being populated and everyone is submitting them, I'd like to start with a question to Irene and Elaine. Um, Let's see. And I think Irene may be taking a break for now. So um, Elaine, if you could answer this. Um, so would you please share a bit more about the advocacy and mental health work you're doing now and what you think your next steps will be? Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, now we had the support group uh, on Zoom and this peer support group for uh, consumer and family member. We will use the language is in Cantonese and Mandarin. And we post this the Zoom link or already in our website. And the next step we develop to Apple uh, the 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 mobile mobile by the app is for provide the suicide uh, is mobile app for our community, one is for the uh, family member, one is for the uh, consumer. So did I already answer that question or not? Yes, that's really helpful. Um, Thank you. Know about what the next steps are for your organization. Um, we see in the Q&A box, there are some questions about how to treat and care for depression and how to help a family member get out of depression. Um, and so I'd like to direct this question to Dr. Chen, um, specifically, where can students and families get help for depression or other mental illnesses? And what does mental health treatment look like? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, this is a big question, of course, because knowing that each individual and family and circumstance is different, just like there are so many different medical issues, there are so many different mental health issues, and um, I imagine Elaine and others may want to add on, so please feel free. But very, very broadly, one way that we can help address mental health issues, honestly, is through events like this, so by breaking the silence and talking about it. 
because if we don't talk and share our stories, there's no way for individuals to access care and treatment. In terms of the actual medical treatments, the first line treatment for many mental health issues, this includes things like mild to moderate anxiety, mild to moderate depression, which both are hugely common, also substance use issues. The first line treatment is therapy. Therapy does not always have to be in the context of a mental health diagnosis. I want to mention that too. Therapy can also be helpful during confusing or stressful times in life, during periods of transition, or to help someone reflect and better understand themselves, their life, their relationships, or to address recurring patterns that might seem unhelpful or hard. Medication is often, but not always used in mental health treatment, and they can sometimes make a huge, huge difference in someone's life. Again, the medication that we would use would vary on the condition that we are treating, just like with other medical illnesses. But most commonly, we use antidepressant medications like SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Those are the first line medicines we will sometimes use with things like anxiety and depression. We also use medications like stimulant medication for conditions like ADHD, and we use medicines called mood stabilizers for different kinds of mood disorders or bipolar disorders. And of course, there are many, many, many others. Um, and in terms of accessing treatment, for those of you who aren't already in care, um, I know finding treatment anywhere in the US can oftentimes be really hard. I think we'll be sharing some resources at the end, but a great first line place to go um, for students is school. A lot of people don't realize that um, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges um, will have guidance counselors and social workers and psychologists on staff. And that's a great place to get some initial therapeutic support. And regardless of your age, you can always go to your primary care physician. So pediatricians for children and teens and for grownups, primary care, your general primary care physician can help do an initial assessment and can help provide referrals for, for more specialized mental health care if needed. That's a broad overview, but hopefully that's helpful to others. That is extremely helpful. Thank you. I see quite a few questions as a follow-up to you, Dr. Chen. Um, about the signs and symptoms that people should be most aware of. Um, so would you please speak about the warning signals that could indicate that something is wrong and that further intervention is needed, as well as any unique considerations for Asian American youth and adults? Of course, and again, I know this is a big question and others can feel free to add on. The challenge again is because what, um, a mental health disorder might look like is, is gonna vary person to person because there are, all, there are so many different kinds. Um, but knowing that things like anxiety, depression, stress, right, can look really different in each person. So really anything I think that's a deviation from a person's baseline, um, increased worry, tearfulness or crying. It can be mood changes like irritability, impatience, anger. Um, especially with kids, there can sometimes be regression, right? So a child or a teenager might look like they're behaving a certain way at one age and they might regress to be more silly um, or more humorful. There can be um, focus, motivation and attention challenges, motivation with school challenges, procrastination around school or work. Um, there can be social withdrawal, work withdrawal or avoidance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes there can be physical symptoms, and Irene mentioned this in the video, but about changes to sleep, like sleeping a lot or sleeping less or having headaches or fatigue. Also mentioned in the video, things like alcohol and drug use can oftentimes be a way of self-medicating or treating mental health conditions, um, and then just generally problems in work or school or relationships. Um, I should also mention, and I hope this doesn't cause more worry for our audience, but for a certain subset of people, you know, someone could be struggling a great, great, great deal, and it may not necessarily be obvious because they're doing everything they are, quote unquote, supposed to be doing. So for students, maybe it's a very, very hardworking student who's going to school every day and they're perfectionistic and getting things done and getting good grades. Again, not to worry people unnecessarily, but 
you know, going to school and getting good grades doesn't necessarily mean that a person is, is doing fantastically or doing well. This is why it's so important for all of us to be able to have conversations and to check in on each other and for parents to be checking in on their children to really know how is someone doing so that when things are more critical or more severe or when stress is high, that we can talk about it. Because one of the biggest worries, as I think you all know, that when mental health issues and things like anxiety and depression and substance use are not talked about or treated, one of the things we most fear are things like self-harm and suicide. So again, at the risk of confusing everyone here, stress and mental health issues can look like a lot of different things, but please, please, please pay attention to them, particularly things like stress because it's not benign and there can, there can be effective treatment. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Those were really powerful reminders of things to look out for and often things that are overlooked too. So um, we have quite a few questions about where to find support. I think we might've mentioned a little bit more broadly, um, but there have been challenges. I think one participant said that all the therapists that they saw online or out there were booked. Um, and so they're looking for someone who takes new patients and have no luck so far. So Dr. Chen or Elaine or anyone on the panel, would you have any tips for how to actually find a provider? Yeah, I think um, just depend on who seeing the help is from the consumer themselves or the, from family member. Yeah, and also I, I commend the um, psychi uh, psychologist today. There's a very good website to find the resource. And um, yeah, Dr. Chen, do you have any the other uh, comment for that? Thank you, Elaine. No, I agree. Um, Psychology Today, that was and that was just put into the chat, so hopefully you all can see that there, is a wonderful free online uh, searchable directory of mental health providers, and that includes providers across the United States, regardless of where you live. Organizations like NAMI and other mental health organizations can be great places for resources and support. And as I mentioned, it absolutely, unfortunately, is hard to find mental health treatment, particularly now in the setting of COVID-19. Um, the last year and a half has been hard, I think, for all individuals and families. So unfortunately, it has been harder recently, but um, connecting with your primary care doctor can sometimes be an, a, a good way to connect with resources and then also asking your insurance company. Um, they often will maintain lists of providers um, in your network. Thank you, Elaine and Dr. Chen. Um, next, I'd like to um, bring up a question from the Q&A as well. Um, how can I help an adult child recover who stopped seeking medical help and is living in isolation? Yeah, um, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, that's very uh, normal, actually, this, this situation. So uh, we encourage the family daughter, uh, family member. They will um, they will join us. The fee um, we had to provide the education for them. We had the NAMI family to family class, and also we had the NAMI um, the family support group and peer support group. So let the people know then uh, how to deal with this situation. If their family member to know how to connect with the consumer, how to talk with them, and don't let them. Uh, I, I remember some parents say, oh, they don't recognize they already get, has some ills, has some illness. So, so don't, don't, don't talk about that. Sometimes just very care about them. And if they don't sleep well or don't want uh, lost some interesting just care about that if they feel you just care about them maybe they can open their heart to make the next step 
the in the beginning just just build a connection with them. The family member must to to learn more about the knowledge about this. Uh, that's what I to sense. So, how about the other uh, panelists, Doctor Chen? I'm happy to add on. I don't know if other people want to also speak, but um, Jennifer, you can please redirect me. I want to make sure others have an opportunity to share. Um, Elaine, I agree with you completely, and I, I want to really empathize with the person who shared this question um, and just to acknowledge it and know that this, I think, is a very common experience faced by lots of family members. Um, it can be so, so hard to be struggling with mental health issue. And it can be really just as hard and painful to be a family member and seeing someone you know struggling. I wish there was an easy answer, but as many of you know, you can't necessarily make a person think or feel or act in a certain way. And you cannot compel someone to get into treatment. And at the risk of repeating myself, this is why events like this and breaking the silence around mental health issues within our larger community, um, why these things are so, so, so critical, because I think the stigma and silence around mental health is one of the dominant barriers to getting treatment. And if we all felt more comfortable talking about our mental health struggles, we would be more open to getting the treatment that we need. In terms of um, more concretely, if you're in a situation where you are worried about a family member, knowing you can't compel them or force them to get into treatment, um, I think really just normalizing whatever it is they are going through, they likely are experiencing perhaps a lot of stigma and shame around what they might be feeling. So really just normalizing it so they can feel fully accepted no matter what they are going through to really be there, um, to really have a non-judgmental stance so that when they are ready to talk or they are ready to get treatment, that you are ready to be there with them. Um, perhaps it's accompanying them and spending time with them in whatever small ways, you know, um, um, sitting by their side, having a meal with them, um, offering to go to a medical appointment with them, um, being open to learning and listening really compassionately about what they're going through. Um, that can be really, really powerful too. And then on top of all of that, um, being a caretaker for another person for whatever it is, whether it's a mental health issue or a medical issue or something else can be incredibly hard. And so the other piece of advice I would give is that while you are caring for someone that you love, that you also simultaneously take care of yourself and your own stress and your own mental health um, just because it's so, so, so important that we, that none of us really worry alone. So we'll make sure that you aren't worrying alone as well. Thank you again, Elaine and Dr. Chen. Um, I definitely resonate with everything that you all said. It's such a difficult situation and it's, there's no easy answer, um, but building trust, showing non-judgmental uh, listening, and also educating yourself and engaging in discussion and modeling openness. Those are all really important. Um, I believe we have um, quite a few questions um, that are more specific about um, medical issues and mental health issues. Um, so let's take a break from those. I think many of them have been addressed already. And I'd like to shift gears to um, Professor Chang. Um, a key part of destigmatizing mental illness and creating meaningful change is telling stories. In just a few minutes, your film clip shares Elaine's and Irene's story in such an impactful way. As an expert storyteller, do you have any advice for those of us who want to share our own stories in ways that are concise, compelling, and relatable? Um, Professor Chang, I think you're muted. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. This is a, a great question. I, <laughs> it's hard to answer, though. I, I, um, 
I, I think that I can, from my experience, I find that uh, it is very important that uh, to, to build a trust and uh, in uh, the, uh, if you are, you know, like hearing the, the stories, you know, I first start with my perspective and from uh, to uh, directly to, to tell a story. So I always find that, you know, to, to you know, to work, uh, to build trust and to really be passionate about that, to show your compassion and to a point that you're like the, uh, your party spent the um, is really thinking is really treated there as great opportunity to share the story experience to transform that story that experience to something larger, which is part of you know, the our like, the um, efforts and is a great thing to see that happening. Now, how to tell a a a a, a good story is that. So I I found that everybody is a great storyteller. If the person is passionate about you really, you know, like the uh, face a situation or to a point that you want to share that experience and that experience does not really belong to you. It has a larger significance. It can relabel. And you can always find very strong, strong moments and that moment, a moment is a great a story. It, it lives on song, stands on song. And it always related to your audience, always, you know, if you tell a story, you know, you don't really worry about telling the story. You are passionate about the story drives you. And by the way, just tell you, and don't really worry, we piece together. Okay. <laughs> we piece together story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chang. Um, I think our time is um, getting close. So I'd like to pose one more question. Um, and I think if Irene is not present, then maybe this would be directed to Elaine. But what was helpful for Irene's recovery and what brought you hope during such a difficult time? That, that's a very good question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I think uh, you cover it, you cover it to us is the process. So uh, I don't expand we will have some goal, but if we want to help Irene's recovery, um, I, I need mean they, they depend three ways. One way is, yeah, she can find a very good um, medical team, um, the treatment plan, uh, that's very important. We try our best to find uh, the good psychiatrist, the psychologist, and then, treatment team for her. And also we will rebuild her relationship with the schools, with the community. And then last thing is very important to build up herself the competence. Um, when you have some illness to, you can reach out your goal when uh, have the very a lot of stigma in community how to how you to uh, even you have this illness even you have mental health challenge but you still can have the confidence to to do to, to do what 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 you want so uh, I think I uh, I think I already uh, answered this question so do you think is anything uh, we can add? Yeah, Dr. Chen or? Mm -hmm. I so appreciate, Elaine, thank you for sharing. And also Jennifer, this, your question and, and the part about hope, um, because sometimes I think when we're having conversations like this, it can feel a little overwhelming and, and negative, but kind of underscoring the point we were making earlier about mental, mental health issues being common, um, 
treatable and in some cases preventable, there is always hope. Hope is so critical and underlies I think everything that we do, and it underlies certainly the work that I do, and I imagine, Elaine, all the incredible advocacy work that you do, there is always, always hope. Um, I think, honestly, one of the most powerful ways, and keeping in mind I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, so I think about things always in the context of families, um, but really is our, is our connection to each other and families. And so for kids and teens, honestly, not to add to the heavy burden that parents already have and the incredible hard work of being a parent each day, but children's and children and teens really look to their families and parents for that hope. And so the more that there can be conversation, the more that there can be normalization, I, you know, I think that's where the hope really begins. And one of the most powerful things about our community at the risk of reinforcing stereotypes, but I think one of the most powerful things about our community is our connection to each other and our and our belief in family and our connection to our community and so if we can just harness that in positive ways i think that can that can be the huge a huge huge difference in helping so many so many people within our community who are struggling so again i don't mean to be overly simplistic but i think really it's it's connection and communication as one of the most dominant ways that we can help build hope. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah, it's very important. And also, I remember um, in the beginning, um, Irene always refused this illness. They said, and she said, don't talk about bipolar. I don't like this name. Don't talk about that. I, I, I noticed when her uh, joined the support group, when her meet the, the, the young people just like her who have the um, mental health challenge, that's very helpful for them to, they are not alone. It's very useful. So let them feel the hope. And also that's why, that's why the family member, they must to give them, to let them to try get in the community, get some support from the community. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I will reiterate that hope is neither naive nor foolish. It is actually so valuable and um, it comes from so many places, each unique to each person. So thank you for that really beautiful reminder. Um, I'm sorry, there are quite a few more questions in the Q&A, but I think um, we don't really have time to answer them tonight. Uh, so we, we hope that you'll Per use, you'll look through the resources that we'll share at the end of this webinar um, and learn some more. Um, so with that, I'd like to extend a lot of thank yous. Um, we have thank yous. I guess the first one, the most important is thank you to our participants. Thank you so much for making the time today. We really hope that these conversations continue. And we hope that you found this panel informative, meaningful, and maybe even inspiring. Next, I'd like to thank and also encourage everyone to give a round of applause and thanks via Zoom emoji or chat message, our speakers, uh, Elaine Peng, Irene Wei, Chang Fu Chang, and Juliana Chen, our webinar outreach and support and logistics team, Lily Chen, Tim He, Vicky Cheng, Yuan Wen, Laura Wu, Luca Wang, Xiao Hong Gao, uh, Jessica Pei, Sen Xu, Stephanie Xu, and Phoebe Liu. And also our very talented and dedicated interpreters, Harvey Tai and Cindy Chen. And also we have so many sponsors without whose support we couldn't have made this possible. We have the Howard County Chinese School, the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars, um, Elaine's organization, Mental Health Association for Chinese Communities, the uh, Dr. Chen's organization, the MGH Center for Cross-Cultural Student Emotional Wellness, as well as the Central Virginia Chapter of Advocate, the Chinese Association of West Michigan, the Chinese American Museum, and the Horizon Foundation, all of these supporters, as well as our UCA WAVES partners. 
And I think that's that's all we have for today. Thank you all for coming.